example, let's look at three applications where we use the type of methods that you will learn apply them to real sensor observations. This first example concerns tracking vehicles using observations from a mono camera and comes from this paper by Sommel Scheidegger in 2018. The aim is to estimate the 3D position and velocity of vehicles from a sequence of images, much in the same way as we did in our previous illustration, but with actual camera observations. The observations that are used come from a convolutional neural network, which is trained to detect vehicles and to report a 2D bounding box of the vehicles in the image, as illustrated by these colored boxes, as well as the distance to the object. As we discussed previously, Using a single camera, we cannot directly measure the distance to the vehicle. The distance reported by the network is therefore instead based on learned scale and appearance cues and can sometimes be a bit noisy. However, by filtering these observations in a so-called unscented Kalman filter, which you will learn about in this course, we can get better and less noisy estimates of where the vehicles are. So what we will see to the left is the original image, where the bounding boxes of the detected vehicles are shown in separate colors. To the right is a bird's eye view of the situation, centered at the camera. The detection from the camera is shown as white stars, and the result of our filter is shown as these colored ellipses, with the same color as the bounding boxes in the image. And the plus in the middle here indicates our estimated position, and the stars the actual positions of the vehicles. So ideally, we want our estimate, the plus markers, to be as close as possible to the true position of the vehicles, the stars, which would mean that our guess of where the vehicle is, is accurate. Now, when we start playing the video, we will also illustrate the trace of the vehicle to show the filtered and true vehicle trajectories over time. Now, let's view the result. What we see here is that our filter manages to filter the noisy detections from the camera and over time gets more and more certain about the position of the vehicles. Pretty nice, right? The next example that we're going to look at is related to the geometry of the road ahead of our host vehicle. This work was published in this paper from 2016 where we used observations from a radar and a camera to try to estimate the geometry or shape of the road up to 200 meters ahead of our host vehicle in highway scenarios. Now, from the camera, we get information about the shape of the lane markings of the current lane. These are shown here as red dashed lines. Typically, the camera is able to detect the lane markings up to roughly 50 to 60 meters, but sometimes shorter. The length of these lines indicate how far ahead the lane geometry from the camera is valid. From the radar, we mainly get two things. First, we get the relative position and velocity of other vehicles. These are shown here as these blue dots where the arrow indicates the velocity vector. The second thing that we get is stationary detections from the roadside objects, such as guardrails or barriers, as shown here. So, how can we use this to estimate the geometry of the road? Well, the lane markings coming from the camera is directly related to the shape of the road, right? But in best case, it's only valid up to roughly 50, 60 meters, which is not enough. The radar, on the other hand, can see much further and typically reports objects up to 200 meters or more. However, the radar cannot measure the geometry of the road directly. What it can do is to measure the position and velocity of the other vehicles that are traveling on the road. And as they are traveling on the road, their velocity vector should be roughly parallel to the road, right? Similarly, the reflection from the guardrail, shown here, should also line and be roughly parallel to the road as well. So what we have done is to construct sensor models saying that the camera can measure the road up to 50, 60 meters, that the vehicles that are detected by the radar should drive approximately parallel to the road, and if we are able to detect a guardrail, this guardrail should be approximately parallel to the road as well. Now, if we assume that we can describe the shape of the road using a so-called clothoid spline, so a mathematical model of the road geometry, we can then estimate the parameters of this spline using our sensor models and our observations in an unscented Kalman filter. The resulting clothoid spline is shown here as this magenta colored line, where our uncertainty in the shape of the road is shown as these error ellipses at the spline joints. The black lines here indicate that we have detected a guardrail at these distances perpendicular to the road. The blue dots here 
is the ground truth position of the middle of the host lane, which is what we like to describe. We will plot the results having our host vehicle at the origin, always pointing to the right. So if we run our filter, it could look something like this. Here we see that we're able to fairly accurately describe the shape of the road at also far distances by including information about the direction in which the leading vehicles are traveling and the shape of the detected guardrails. What's happening here is that we get limited information about the shape of the road at 200 meters. So we assume that the road is still bending when it's actually starting to straighten out. We should also note that our uncertainty increases here. Once we get new observations telling the filter that the road has straightened out, our filter quickly adapts. The third example of how we can use the methods that you will learn in this course is related to the problem of self-localization. Let's say that we have an autonomous vehicle which should navigate on its own in this type of city environment. It would surely be beneficial to have some kind of map to navigate by and that our vehicle is able to position itself in this map such that it knows when it's time to make a right at this intersection here, for example. One possible such map could be a semantic 3D point cloud map. Now this is a 3D point cloud where each point is labeled by the semantic class of the object at that specific position. This label could for example be road, sidewalk, building, tree, and so on. This type of map can be constructed from a sequence of semantically segmented street view images using structure from motion and multi-view stereo algorithms. But this is not the focus of this course. So for our little piece of a city, the map could look something like this. So here we see that we have points labeled as road, sidewalk, buildings, trees, vegetation, and some other smaller classes. So let's now assume that this is our map and that we would like to position ourselves in this map. Now we said that this is a 3D point cloud map, which means that each point has a 3D position and that we can view this map from any pose, that is position and heading of our host vehicle. The idea of how to localize our vehicle in this type of map is simple. What we will present here is based on this paper by Eric Steenborg et al. from 2018. Now, assume that we have a camera on our vehicle that can observe this scene. We can then try to align our pose such that if we project our semantic 3D map onto our camera image, our building points will fall on buildings and our tree points will land on trees and so on. Now here is one such image from a camera observing the same scene as our map where we have semantically labeled each pixel in the image with the same classes that we have in our map. We do this by using a deep convolutional neural network that takes an ordinary image as input and outputs a semantic label of each pixel. In the image to the right, we have overlaid the semantic image on the original image, where we can see that the network manages to fairly well label each pixel. Additionally, a subset of our map points are projected onto our image, and as we can see, our black building points fall on buildings, and our green tree points land on trees, for example. This would indicate that the pose that we have used to project our map onto our image matches well with the actual pose of the camera. So how can we use this to position our autonomous vehicle? Well, one way is to use a so-called particle filter, which we will learn all about in this course. Using a particle filter, we would represent the pose of our vehicle, so position and heading, using a whole bunch of more or less randomly chosen particles. Now each particle, here shown in yellow in the figure to the left, describes one possible pose of our vehicle, or actually a whole vehicle trajectory, but let's not focus on that right now. Each particle is then rated by how well it explains our observations. So how well a projection of our map using that particle's pose matches with our semantically segmented images. 
The particle that matches the best will then get a high score, and the particles where the projected map and the semantic segmentation matches poorly will get a low score. When we now run our particle filter, we will see the position of the particles in yellow in this bird's eye view of our semantic 3D point cloud map to the left. And to the right, we will see the semantic segmentation of our current image and the projected map points for the best scoring particle. The green triangle to the left represents the actual position of the vehicle. What we can see with this type of filter is that our uncertainty is described by how spread out our particles are, which is a bit different than the other methods 